Danny Michael Dorzak, D-A-N-N-Y-M-I-C-H-A-E-L-D-O-R-Z-O-K. What is the ethnic background of this last name, Dorzok? Mm -hmm. Prussian or German. German? Mm -hmm. So you are descendant of German? Yes. Is your father emigrated from Germany? No. No, my father um, was an American-born citizen. Mm -hmm. My mother was a German citizen. I see. Mm -hmm. So what is your birthday? December 8th, 1985. December 8th? 1985. 85. And where were you born? I was born in Germany, uh, Stuttgart area. Oh. I can't remember the exact um, location, but Stuttgart. So do you have a both citizenship? I did, and I believe until age 18. So, ah. mm -hmm. And now you're American citizen? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your family background when you were growing up. Your father, mother, and your siblings. Um, well, I have a half-brother and a half-sister. My mother was a German citizen. Uh -huh. um, my father um, and uh, her got married when um, he was active duty in the Army. Uh -huh. And um, from that point forward... Uh, so your father was U.S. Army? Yes. In Germany? Uh, he was U.S. Army, yes. stationed in Germany. Stationed in mm -hmm. Germany. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your uh, schools that you went through. Um, which one? What do you mean? Like, like a elementary school to high school. Well, I went to uh, school in Germany till about age 10. And then from there, I moved to the United States after my mother had died. And uh, from that point forward, I moved on and uh, started fifth grade. And from there on, I graduated high school. It is weird to, to have uh, young veterans like you mm -hmm. because I've been doing interviews with the Korean War veterans who were born in the, around, uh, in the era of Great Depression, 1929. Mm -hmm. So good to have uh, young veterans. Mm -hmm. And so after the high school graduation, what did you do? Right after high school, I, um, I was already enlisted in the Navy at the time. But, you mean in, um, in the high school? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, I, I was recruited in high school, mm -hmm. right after high school. Um, I believe it was like two weeks later, I uh, was already in boot camp. Where? Uh, Great Lakes, Illinois. Tell me about this uh, boot camp area, Great Lakes, Illinois. Mm -hmm. how, how is it? Well, um, we really didn't get to explore a whole lot outside of, you know, the compound or, or the uh, um, area that we were stationed at for basic training. Um, so we were pretty much confined to that location. We weren't really allowed to leave, um, but um, that's a, you know, <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. And tell me why you chose to, to belong to Navy. Well, originally my plan was to become a Naval Special Warfare, so Navy, Navy SEALs. Oh. Um, and from that point forward, I was going to make a career out of uh, my military service there in the U.S. Navy. So you, from the beginning, you wanted to be a real professional Right. Military personnel, right? Correct. Yeah. Well, I was still in high school when the um, Twin Towers got hit. Um, I remember watching it on TV. Um, at first, I didn't really pay that close attention to what was going on. I just saw a plane crashing into a, a building until I got home and I turned on the TV and I saw what, what happened. And, um, of course, everybody was kind of in a panic. They really didn't know what was going on, who did it, what, what the purpose was. And, um, but then, you know, later down the road, we come to find out that um, what we believed at the time was, you know, a terrorist act. So. 
Does that motivate you to, to join the military? Yeah, at the time it did. Mm. <laughs> um, really for, patriotic yeah. Yeah. at the time. Yeah. How long was the basic military training in Great Lakes? I honestly don't even remember. Mm? Um, I don't remember exactly how long it was. It's kind of just a blur. <laughs> how was it? Was it hard? Uh, it was, for me, it was relatively easy. Um, Why? I was a runner in, <clears throat> in uh, high school on the varsity I see. Uh, cross country team. So, and then, you know, with, you know, the discipline that my dad has taught me at a young age has uh, really helped. So, boot camp was kind of just another thing to do, <laughs> just to get done, you know, and uh, really wasn't all that difficult. So you were physically fit already and yeah. ready yeah. and confident. Mm -hmm. So yeah, from I, there, where did you go? From there, I <clears throat> was stationed in Point Loma, which is in San Diego, California. Point? Point Loma. Loma, could you yeah, spell it? L-O-M-A, I think, is what it is. Um, in San Diego? San Diego, yeah. Uh -huh. It's just north of San Diego. Um, I went there to do what's called my A school, um, and that is um, basically training for what you enlisted for. Um, your basically, other branches call it your MOS, like your job, <clears throat> and uh, I went there uh, to complete A school. What did you do there? I was actually uh, an aviation structural mechanic, so. Aviation? Structural mechanic. Tell me about it. What is it? Uh, it involves repairing airfoils, um, composite material, uh, carbon fiber material, a lot of basically anything that has to do with the structure of the aircraft. That was kind of what we had to do, or that was our job. And that also included uh, tire maintenance. It also included hydraulic maintenance, hydraulic actuating units, things like that. That seems to be a little apart from the, your original goal to, right. uh, to be a Navy SEAL. Right. Huh? Right. Why did you choose that? Well, um, the timing just really didn't line up. Um, the Navy really wanted me to complete my A school. And even during boot camp, too, we, um, I wasn't really allowed to <clears throat> deviate too much from the training. It was uh, an occasionally my... Uh, um, recruit division commander would let me go and actually work with the uh, well in Great Lakes they basically had like a like a I, almost like a, uh, a program that allows you to train early on to be prepared to go to what they call BUDS training mm -hmm. or uh, it's like Hell Week um, to prepare you yeah. physically and mentally um, and at the time when I was in boot camp, they really didn't, like I said, they really didn't allow that too much. Um, so again, the timing didn't line up and they just kept moving me from duty station to duty station. Mm -hmm. Is it hard to be trained as an aviation structural mechanic? How long did it take for you to, to be qualified? Uh, I think from what I remember, the school is 12 weeks, but that is just the very basic, that's like the tip of the iceberg. There's uh -huh. a lot more involved once you actually get out to the fleet. There's a lot more hands-on training that goes on, a lot of manual reading from what I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Mm -hmm. And then from there, where did you from, go? From uh, after A school, I was transferred to NAS North Island, which is Naval Air Station North Island, which is almost directly across from San Diego. Mm. You could see it from downtown. And from there, I was um, assigned to, I believe it was a helicopter unit at the time for more training. And then after that, I was assigned to the USS Nimitz. USS what? Nimitz. Nimitz. Yeah. N-I-M-I-T-Z. Correct. That's aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. So did you do the same thing, aviation structural mechanic there? Mm -hmm. 
Tell me about USS Nimitz. Uh, what kind of uh, aircraft is that and how many people, what are the capacity of it, when was built? Well, um, I don't remember when it was built, but I can tell you that there's about 1,200 people when we are not deployed, um, which just basically man the different departments within the ship. Um, so aviation being one of them, there's also you know laundry, security, and different ones like that. Once we deploy, we take on uh, squadrons, usually from North Island, and they they don't usually show up until we are out at sea yeah. always, because they will fly their aircraft onto the carrier, and then once they are on the carrier, then we get them situated and um, get their departments up and running, and then from there we. Uh, deploy wherever we're needed mm -hmm. uh, anywhere in the world. So now you become sailor. Yes. And what was your rank? I started out as an E1. E1. Yeah, which is the lowest on the totem pole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I did end up uh, receiving um, a promotion just before I left boot camp. Mm -hmm. So I excelled uh, academically um, and in my basic training. So I received E2 right out of boot camp. And then uh, shortly after that, I uh, was an E3. And then about a year and a half into my uh, training and being deployed, I uh, was a third class petty officer. Third class? Petty officer. What does that mean in terms of, uh, I, I'm not familiar with Navy ranks, so could you convert, uh, the, uh, could you convert to Army, like a corporal? It would be a, um, I think it's a corporal. Okay. Yeah. How much do they pay? <laughs> uh, well, once you... When, you... when you become third petty officer, mm -hmm. how much do they pay you? I honestly don't even recall. It, it wasn't a whole Approximately. lot. Approximately. Um, I don't know. I don't remember. I have it in my file, uh -huh. uh, like a pay stub. Rough. Maybe eight, nine hundred dollars a month, from what I remember, or or not. Like thirteen hundred a month, I think. It. About thousand. Yeah. Yeah, about yeah, a thousand. A little, little more than that, maybe. Mm -hmm. But you didn't need that money in, in, you know, while you are in the Navy, right? No, not really. Um, you know, it's kind of nice once you're out, on, out at sea. There's only 1,068 feet you can go one way right. and about three, 400 feet across in each direction. So, um, so you pretty much save your money. Right. Um, it's kind of nice. Um, and they feed you and they're, mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah. Tell me about the life inside of the Nimitz. Uh, where did you sleep and how many in one quarter and so on? What kind of beds and so on? Uh, well, we were on the starboard side aft, so the right back end of the ship. I was down about two, two or one deck below the hangar bay. Um, and we were in what's called a berthing, and that's where we uh, all sleep. And there's three bunks, uh, three high, three bunks, three high, and um, you get maybe six feet by three feet sleeping space. That's it. That's it. Um, and you get a your bunk opens up, and you can store things inside your bunk, and you get a small locker that you can store things in. Uh, showers, uh, it was a communal shower, not, well, yep. not communal shower. Um, we had three stalls, and then you just take turns as the shift comes on or, you know, as you leave duty for the day, then the, uh, you'd take a shower and go to sleep and do it all over again the next day. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we had daily they called it cleaning stations, daily cleaning stations. Everybody dreaded that. Everybody absolutely hated it. And Why? It, it was just tedious and just, you know, a mindless uh, 
thing to do. You know, I understand it has to be done, but you know, they, they make it like an hour long and it doesn't always take an hour and then you sit there and you always have to watch out for your chief walking through or like a higher, higher rank petty officer, you know. If you're caught sleeping, you get in trouble. If you're caught <laughs> sitting around, you get in trouble. And hey, you're some military, so <laughs> yeah. they have to have it. Yeah. 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 So we always joked and, you know, pushing dust bunnies around. So, <laughs> so are we still talking about 2005? Uh, when you were, when you were in Nimitz, when was it? Um, the first, roughly the first two and a half years I was on the Nimitz. Oh. Um, Two or two and a half to three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so where did you go, and what did you do there? I mean, did 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 you have actual operation there? Were there? I mean, any engagement with other other country? Actually, tell me about it. What was yeah, the we, main mission, and uh, what did you do? The first mission was uh, we were deployed over to the Gulf, in support of uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Enduring Freedom. Our, jo our main job was to um, provide air support for ground troops um, in various locations wherever they, they need us. The uh, planes would uh, go to those destinations and uh, take care of the enemy. Um, so our job was to mainly keep the aircraft running. If there was downtime, we would uh, do the maintenance on the aircraft and get them up as soon as we could back into a full operation. Um, so that was the first deployment. We were deployed for, from what I recall, at least nine months. Nine months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And were there any dangerous moments or no, nothing, right? No, no enemy aircraft ever near to your no, or rockets not, or missiles? No, not, not, not as far as we were concerned. Uh, we had an entire fleet in that area, so. Um, Anybody who would even try to consider doing something to harm, you know, anybody on an aircraft carrier, I mean, we'd take care of them mm -hmm. fairly quickly. So um, we did. Uh, we 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 did actually do a couple of uh, um, they call them war games, and uh, we would do exercises yep. with India, um, us, I think China at one point. I don't really recall. Um, yeah. Tell me about what kind of uh, problem do they have in terms of aircraft structure? I mean, once they got out, sorry, mm -hmm. and coming back, mm -hmm. what kind of problems do you find uh, in the structure of the aircraft? I mean, these must be F-16? F-18s. F-18s, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. what kind of problem do they have? Um, usually it's just routine maintenance, you know, like there's a scheduled downtime for aircraft. Uh, for every so many flight hours, there have to be so many maintenance hours. So a lot of it was maintenance, um, but um, we really haven't had any major problems with the aircraft. Um, I mean, they, they didn't really come back shot up or anything from what we could remember. Um, a lot of it was just maintenance and keeping them flying. So no U.S. aircraft ever been hit by Iraqi missiles or anything? Not that I remember from our uh, deployment. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, you know, I certainly can't uh, find, you know, I, I don't know about other. So you stayed through in the Nimitz on that operation. Mm -hmm. And after that, where did you go? We came back to San Diego, uh -huh. and then we had a like a, a scheduled downtime um, where the entire aircraft carrier um, gets either updates yep. or gets a new paint job. Um, so that way, we, we were down. I want to say maybe six months or something like that. And then after we did all the maintenance, the routine maintenance, we were uh, operational ready again and then we were deployed a second time. Um, to where? I don't remember <laughs> um, because they really didn't tell us. I know we were over in like Russia, uh, Malaysia, India and those kinds of areas and I 
want to say, from what I recall, that was more of a uh, a joint, uh, almost like a di diplomatic uh, mission, because at the time we were trying to see if the Indian Navy would join in, uh, I forget his name, some admiral, he wanted to... Uh, Got it. So it's vision, almost, yeah. His vision was to have a bigger navy, a joint navy, a joint. Uh, so our main task was to go over there and talk to India. And, mm -hmm. and when you came back to San Diego, you didn't have to stay inside of the Nimitz, right? No, I did. You have to? Mm -hmm. yeah. all, all of the sailors? All the time. You had a certain, um, you know, it's, it's a normal work week. Monday through Friday, unless you know you have to pull an extra duty. Um, but there was a scheduled time when you stood certain watches. There was a scheduled time when you worked, and usually your weekends were free. So we we did rotate on weekends, but you go um, out. Yeah, and you can you know you can do whatever you want on the weekends or after your your duty you is over. You can stay outside, right? Oh yeah, we yeah we weren't confined to the Nimitz. We. You know, we we were allowed to leave, go into town, go into San Diego, um, walk around. Um, but do you have to come back? For yeah, sleep? but there's no. Um, from what I remember, there's really no curfew. Mm. Just as long as you come back, mm. as long as you come back for your your duty the next day, or your when you come back for your job, you know. So. So. Um, and after that second operation around mm -hmm. Russia, Malaysia, India, mm -hmm. where did you? Uh, what's what was third? The third one um, actually was in the uh, southern part of Iraq, down in Camp Bucca. Camp Bucca, B-U-C-C-A. It's mm -hmm. in southern Iraq. Yes. And you, were you in the land or? Just I was stationed on land. Okay, tell me about that. When was it actually? That was the last tour in around 2008. Mm -hmm. um, so if you finally got out of the midst mm -hmm. and then you dispatched it to the... Almost. What, what I did in, in between that time before I went to um, Camp Buka, I had my uh, maintenance officer for our department, he wanted me to go to search and rescue swimmer school. Uh, they needed a person to uh, man the search and rescue operations, and he called me in his office personally. And at first, when he did that, I wasn't sure what he wanted. <laughs> it was kind of a scary moment because you don't know you don't know what you're being called in there for. You know, and he was very casual with me, and he said. Uh, you know, you know what? Why? Why did I call it? You don't want to know why I called you in here, and I told him, "No, sir, I have no idea why you called me." You know, and he says, "Well, we need a rescue swimmer." So he said, "Are you willing to do it?" And I was very f upfront with him, and I said, "Well, I haven't really been working out or training the last three months, so from my normal physical fitness versus where I was at was not where I wanted to be." But I ended up. Um, I, I did say yes, so they changed my orders, and I went to the 32nd Street base, which was just across from North Island. And from there, I, I went through the search and rescue swimmer school. Um, didn't make it through. Uh, There's a couple exercises that I just couldn't do. I just ran out of breath. Um, That's top. Yeah, it's training, not it's right? not an easy uh, easy thing to do, but. Um, you know, but you must be a good swimmer now. Oh yeah, I'm a oh. good swimmer. Um, so then after that, um, I didn't go back, but I needed orders either back to the Nimitz or somewhere else, so they uh, cut me orders to uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Um, so then I was uh, leaving that. I, I left San Diego. I went to Virginia, and then from there we went to uh, New Jersey. And that's where I trained with the Army as a, uh, well, they call it NPDB-5. N NPDB-5. Mm -hmm. It stands for uh, Naval Provisional Detainee Battalion. 
Nay will. Mm -hmm. Provisional. Provisional. Detain yeah. Detainee. Detainee. Battalion. Yeah. So basically, I was training to um, be a uh, prison guard for um, anybody that was captured by the army at the time. When we first invaded Iraq, um, we set up this camp for prisoners that were caught during wartime, and they were processed according to, you know, their laws and United States laws. So, um, and they would serve their prison sentence. And at what I did is I um, trained in New Jersey with the Army to um, become a basically a. a detainee prison guard. So. What kind of training? Uh, medical training. We did a lot of uh, uh, IVs, like intravenous lines. Oh. I was trained as a combat lifesaver, so uh, we were trained all the way up to dealing with uh, like missing limbs, um, like severe trauma, things like that. Why um, do you need that? I mean, just as a prison guard, why do you need that? Well, it was to render aid to anybody that was injured. Um, I mean, we were we were under constant, you know, threat of potentially getting hit by a mortar, or you know, we don't know. Some detainees actually did try to escape, so you don't really know what you can be up against, and if something happens, uh, you need to be prepared for the situation. So, uh, so that training was pretty in depth. After that, um, I trained. What else? Medical and what else? Medical. Then we learned how to drive Humvees. Um, we learned how to uh, um, follow in a convoy and how to engage um, the enemy. And what was interesting is they actually had. Um, Department of Defense civilians who would dress up as Iraqis or the Taliban and we would drive through these makeshift towns and they would try and mess with you and they try and you know to kind of give you an idea of what it would be like when yep. you're really over there. Mm -hmm. um, so we did convoy training, we did um, weapons training we with uh, M203s, M16s, um, we did riot training, like learning how to take somebody down to the ground. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Uh, what are the kind of emotions in your mind? Um, I would say once we actually lifted off for, with the Black Hawk helicopter, that's where things got real. Like I thought, wow. First, I thought, what am I doing? Mm. You know, this is what what crazy idea yeah. was this? You know, and. Um, and I, you know, for as far as your eye could see from the horizon, there was a few trees, a few shrubs. It was all sand. I remember uh, an oil well burning in the distance, uh -huh. uh, black, you know, big black cloud. And, it's like um, a just like a scenes from the TV news, right? Yeah, it was, you know, very, I guess you could say very similar to what the Gulf War was like. Not as many oil wells burning, but, or oil, you know, oil rigs, but definitely uh, definitely a, a weird feeling you know were you heightened or afraid or um, not particularly um, I mean you kind of train your mind to accept where you're at um, I mean there was always a constant feeling of you know your life being in danger but not immediately so, but it was always in the back of your mind that, you know, we could get shot down in a helicopter. Mm -hmm. We may not make it into Camp Buka, but um, we had um, pretty good, uh, you know, we were armed pretty well. Even the helicopters were armed pretty well, so, um, yeah. So tell me about the uh, prison. Um there in Camp Buka. How big was it and how many mates there and so on? Um, well, we had a chief assigned to the compounds. There was, uh, I want to say 14, 13 or 14 compounds. 
And when, within each compound there were, they called them MDHUs, uh, Modular Detainee Housing Units. Mm -hmm. and they were basically two shipping containers welded together like, a, like you'd see on a, uh, on a ship. Mm -hmm. And they weld those together and they put uh, toilets in there and they have mattresses in there. So, but it's modified so they can't really um, get out. Mm -hmm. um, you're with uh, several guard mates. Um, and you're also with a couple of uh, Iraqi correctional officers. So that was kind of uh, an interesting thing working with the Iraqis. Um, you know, and in, to some extent you'd always think that, you know, are they working for the Taliban? You know, are they really there to, you know, help make a difference? And, but they were really good. Uh, a lot of the guys we built a lot of good relationships with the Iraqis that we were there. Mm -hmm. Got along really good. Um, they learned a lot about our culture. You know, they'd always ask me questions. You know, like like what? Uh, you know, <laughs> um, gosh. Well, from what I can remember, they really liked our shampoos. No. Oh. Um, I know. I remember they'd always uh, ask me. You know. They always want shampoo for their wives because it's good shampoo, I guess. I don't really know. Um, so I would go to the uh, Navy Exchange, which is on our side of the camp, or you know, it's a secure, separate, secured area where we stay. And I would go there and I would bring them back, you know, fifty, sixty dollars worth of, uh, you know, toiletries and goods. And it was kind of funny because I would set these things out for them and it's like they almost fought over them like a bunch of two-year-olds, you know? It was kind of funny, but, uh, you know, I almost got to the point where I had to like ration out certain uh, ones to yeah, certain right. people. But, I think um, I saw that part in some movie that mm -hmm. they love this uh, American or Western shampoo and toiletry, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, they, uh, <laughs> they really, really like those things. Um, but then what they would do for me, um, they would actually go to their market, like in town, like in, uh, I think it was in Umkazer or Mosul mm -hmm. at the time, and they would go to the Iraqi market and they would bring back things, gifts for us yes. to have. Yeah. So we were trying to build relationships in that sense, um, and I actually, there was one Iraqi uh, correctional officer I remember his name was Samir and he was uh, this skinny little guy and you know bunch of missing teeth but nicest guy ever and he was just so interested in um, like our culture and, and we got to the point where I was trying to learn more Arabic from him mm -hmm. you know I we, we we would rove the compound together and when we were in an area that you know, didn't have a lot of detainees, we would get to talking and we, I tried learning body parts, you know, like what, what's your, the name for your ear, what's the name for your nose? And he would do the same thing. He would ask me <laughs> in English, what, what does, you know. So basic elementary kindergarten. Right. <laughs> teaching, mutual teaching, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. So exchange of culture and yeah. language. Yeah. There was definitely a language barrier, but it was always nice when you had a, um, the interpreter would come by every once in a while and that really helped, um, you know, um, with the language barrier. Like if, if they wanted to know something about us, I would tell them, you know, and vice versa, we'd exchange information. Um, just for my own personal safety, I never gave them exactly where I lived just because, you know, you, you have to still keep some sense of, um, safety for yourself and your family and you know they'd always ask me I just you know they asked me where do you live I said California and you know never tell them details of where exactly in California you, you lived so um, yeah how many inmates were there uh, I want to say maybe Probably 200 per compound, I want to say. Mm -hmm. 
So you have two different hierarchies. One, one of them is correctional officer working with you, more right. friendly, mm -hmm. right? Right. And other is obviously the prisoner of war mm -hmm. inmates. Mm -hmm. Do you see real difference between those two groups? Not really, other than, you know, they, they other than they want to harm you. Um, and oh, the, still, they were, they were oh, very... Yeah, they, the other thing, I mean, they didn't like us, for sure. Um, and actually, they, they were kind of uh, uh, hateful toward the Iraqi correctional officers. Mm -hmm. And certain interpreters actually were masked so the um, they, cannot they could not identify that f that person because they would, you know, I'm sure they'd have connections with family right. and you know, and they wanted to make sure that their safety was maintained and the safety of their family was maintained. So, what about the facility for the inmates? You said it's a shipping, what is it? The container shipping containers yeah. and must be so hot there, right? No, everything was air conditioned. Oh, even um, for the inmates? Yeah, even for the inmates. Mm -hmm. um, that basically, uh, I believe, fell under the Geneva Conventions, mm -hmm. where we, regardless if you're a prisoner of war, you still need to be treated with humanity or treated humanely. You yep. know, provide food, you know, the, the necessary basic human rights, I guess. Um, so, but as far as like comfort goes, uh, the only thing they really had were mattresses and two-piece uh, yellow suits, you know, and they were maybe uh, like a nylon material, so um, they can't really hide anything in those, They're very cheaply made, and that was the idea, so if we needed right. to search them, uh, which is also part of my job, if we needed to search mm -hmm. for any paraphernalia, we mm -hmm. uh, were able to easily find those things. What about your compound, your living uh, quarters, how was it? Um, we, well, it was kind of like a trailer home, so uh, actually was a trailer home cut in half, and then you have uh, four guys per trailer home or half trailer home. You get a big locker where you can put your gear. You um, get your own bed, and you can you know have blankets, pillows, and it's air conditioned, uh, so that it's kind of like a little home. But you're with four other, four other, three other guys, so. So you didn't feel any heat there? Uh, <laughs> only when the generators went down. Okay. Um, all of the units had air conditioning systems, but the uh, generators had to go down for maintenance every, I think like every month, to change out the oil and change out the air filters. and So that way we would continue being comfortable. But that downtime can sometimes be as long as, you know, four, five, six hours. and. I remember a couple times in the middle of the night waking up uh, with no air, air conditioning and all of a sudden you'd sit there and you're sweating in your bed, you know, and that was never fun, so. But uh, the, first, the first day we actually, we were, we were in tents, that we were air, in air conditioned tents. And they were waiting for the last group of uh, uh, army personnel to leave because the whole purpose of NPDB-5, or our battalion, was to relieve some of the army personnel so they could go back home to their family and you know, get, get some break time. So we would take over, that, and that's why they cross-trained us to be uh, detainee prison guards. Um, so then once we moved out of the tents, um, we moved into those, into those units, mm -hmm. and it was, Kind of funny because uh, you know the the Navy Exchange where you get all your goods and your military like uniforms. Like PX. Yeah, exactly. Same thing. PX. Yeah. Um, they would sell you know refrigerators, microwaves, things like that. But it was kind of like a little underground market <laughs> because we were there. I, I'm not kidding you. We were there for an hour, and all of a sudden these guys that are leaving they go, Hey, do you want a refrigerator? Cool. Like, sure. The cool. the army guys that were leaving because, you know, they were they were trying to get their stuff out, but it's they garage had to sell sale. It. Garage sale, yeah, exactly. So it was like a moving garage sale and they would say, Hey, do you want a fridge? And, you know, all four of us that were assigned to each house uh, They don't provide refrigerator to the mm -mm. No, you trailer? gotta buy that stuff yourself. Hey, that's yeah. not fair. Well, <laughs> 
but we so they would come by and they said hey do you want a fridge sure and you know we give them cash you know 25 bucks per person or whatever so now we had a fridge you know 20 minutes later you get a guy coming in do you want a microwave <laughs> sure so we pay him off and we get the microwave and by the time we were done settled in on the first day we had a fridge like a mini fridge a microwave and a hot water boiler for like ramen noodles you know things like, like that. ramen well it was kind of like the staple yeah. <laughs> you know what so. about the food did you like the food there what kind of food did you um it was uh american food so you could get your good hand. enough yeah you could you know and there's different uh different areas so you could get like fried chicken chicken strips french fries if you wanted it um salad uh, sub sandwiches things like that but what steak? we would do no no steak why not I don't know <laughs> but uh, so you didn't have any complaint no and what we would do but well the only complaint was we had to walk far to get to the dining hall huh. you know we'd walk probably three four hundred yards to get to the dining hall hey come on but what well what we would do actually we assigned like our buddies a certain day of the week where you go to the galley and you pick up bread you pick up meat <laughs> and then we would stock it stockpile it in our fridge because you know you were working 16 hour days in you know 120 degree temperatures you you work six days and you get one day off and at the end of the day when you 16 hours 16 a day hour days yeah and it might sometimes is longer depending on how long it takes for the the next gr uh, group of guys to come in and relieve you from your post well um, you know you get back from your 16 hour shift and you just want to take a shower and go to bed you don't want to go you don't mm -hmm. want to go to the galley you know it's <laughs> it's too far of a walk and you're exhausted so the nice thing was you could open up the refrigerator, you know, grab some meat and some bread and make yourself some food and go to sleep. So, so what did you learn about Iraq in your high school uh, world history classes? Do you remember? Mm, not much. <laughs> uh, I guess at the time um, we really didn't focus too much on that. We learned a lot more. I mean, at that time, maybe we learned about the Gulf War, but that was about it. Um, a lot of colonial history, a lot of American history. Um, so I guess the war on Iraq at that time really wasn't a focal point. Mm -hmm. um, Did you know about the religion in Iraq? Not at the time. Not at the time? Mm -hmm. And what about Saddam Hussein? What did you think of him? Well, I know he wasn't a nice guy. Uh, killed a lot of people. Dictator. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really wasn't, you know, I really wasn't aware, like I said, aware of a mm -hmm. lot of things that were going on in the Middle East. So. While you were there, you were not aware of? Well, Saddam was captured. Um, I believe, let's see, I want to say he was captured after I got out mm -hmm. of the military. So yeah, because I got out in 2009, so it was after that time, yeah. yeah. And what do you think about the war with Iraq? I mean, we were told that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, right? Mm -hmm. And CIA and national intelligence agencies, they provided some evidence. Mm -hmm. We're still looking for weapons of mass destruction there, right? Mm -hmm. We still haven't found. Mm -hmm. Were there any dangerous situation where that you could be wounded by this inmates or enemy attacks there what they is camp buka is it was it kind of safe area or um relatively safe um i would say your immediate threat would be the detainees themselves um 
some of them would try to get smart with you. They uh, they tried to get physical with you. Um, I remember um, like the very second or third day that we were there when they were training us to run in to work inside the compound. Like, do you know the little Bic razors? The uh, the two with the two blades. Mm -hmm. Well, they would take those blades out of the razor and then they would take a gum wrapper uh. and stick the gum wrapper inside the blade. So when you look at it, it looks just like a razor blade. So you had to pay close attention to each razor because they were rationed out. And then <clears throat> after they were done shaving, they would have to bring them all Return, back to us. Yeah. Um, so you had to be careful for you know paraphernalia, for shanks. Um, I remember one of the um, windows that were inside of the compound, they had worked the metal loose on the bottom mm. and had a piece of metal about this long, which mm. could have been used for you know, injuring anybody who's working in there. You know, uh, could have been turned into a shank. Um, yeah. I would say, though, um, <laughs> I have a kind of an interesting story. I was going around and checking on all of my, uh, doing a head count, checking on all of the inmates, and there was a little door that I could look through underneath, and they're not supposed to hang their clothing up, it's supposed to be down, and they were really ingenious with the uh, little juice boxes that we would give them yeah. for drinks. They would take the straws out of them and then tie them together. They would flatten them out and tie them together, and they would make clothing lines out of them, and they'd hang their clothes over the window so we couldn't see. Hmm. So we would have to tap on the window and tell them, you know, take down the, take it down so we could look inside. Um, but one of the uh, inmates there took a bunch of straws and wove them together, where he hung the straws from the ceiling, and his Quran was suspended from the ceiling, hanging in front of him with these straws. So as I looked in there, he was, you know, doing his prayer. So I didn't bother him out of respect, but I, uh, and I didn't want to take it down out of respect. So I waited till he was done, and you know, I told all of my uh, f my guard buddies, and they just they all were laughing, you know. So. Um, what is the routine of your job? At, uh, for example, uh, take a day. Mm -hmm. And let us give a routine. What time do you wake up? What do you do? And then mm -hmm. what do you do with the inmates? What is the major job description of yours? Uh, we would uh, come in in the early morning. Usually, usually the sun was up by the time we get out there, but I, I want to say maybe around 7 a.m. We would uh, get onto these five-ton trucks and there was, you know, five, ten of us, fifteen guy or fifteen guys, and we would drive from there to the to different checkpoints before we would go into the actual uh, secure side. And the army personnel would make sure we had our ID cards. They would check our ID cards, check us for any kind of um, paraphernalia, and you know. Ma basically what that was for is to make sure that we're not helping out the enemy. So they would do like a search, nothing crazy, just a basic search. But then after that we would um, go through the first set of gates and then we would go into the inner part of it and from that point forward we would uh, meet up with the crew that, was, uh, that we were relieving and they would pass on any kind of uh, information. information from the night before of what happened or if there's an incident or anything like that. Uh, and then we talked to our chief, make sure he didn't have anything. Um, if we got a new detainee, we would, you know, be made aware of that. And then our evening started where we would check into our guard shack, get our gear, um, and check in with the Iraqi correctional officers that were working at the time. And then from there you, uh, you, you would do your roves, um, throughout the compound, but before you even did that, you did a head count. You'd go around to each uh, uh, unit, MDHU, and you would do a head count, and each uh, detainee had their own wristband, 
So you had to make sure that the wristband matched up because they all had pictures. So you'd have to match up, um, match up the picture. And uh, some of those guys wouldn't want to wear their bands, and they're supposed to. So they, you know, little acts of defiance, and you know, you got to pick your battles in that situation. But uh, so we do a head count, and after that, we would, you know, I want to say we fill out various pieces of paper uh, to make sure that people were um, accounted for. Mm -hmm. Um, and then from that point, we would be as actually assigned to different spots, and we would rotate throughout the night. So one person would be up in the guard tower, another guy would be down in the in the main area where we would watch the detainees so they could get recreation, so they were able to go outside, and we'd watch that. Uh, other times we'd go around and we would rove, and then another spot you'd have um, people watching uh people when they were, you know, doing their personal hygiene things, you know, making sure that there wasn't anything going on. So wherever you went, there was always um, somebody. So it's uh, just, we can imagine just like a regular prison. Yeah, just like an yeah. American-run prison. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Were you able to um, build a relationship with Iraqi civilian there? Were you able to contact them and to learn more about their life? Um, like, uh, like, like you, you are invited to, to a family of correctional officer or something like that, or yeah. going to go to Iraqi parties and, and holidays and so on. Yeah, we, uh, um, <laughs> I was actually uh, nominated by the Iraqis that, um, that I was with, and they invited me to uh, take part in a, a, like a dinner. And we, of course, ate that in the guard shack, uh, in, inside the, the, like the, the unit that we were in, where we take our breaks and get out of the So heat. you're not going actually their home, but inside of it, right? Not to their home home, but... Right. Um, their, their residence, I mean the residential quarters inside of the camp. Um, no, not they were. I mean, they were assigned to us during the day. Yeah. And um, but we, you know, they usually ate separate from us. You're right. Um, but at you know, and it's. Can they commute from their own home? No. I think they're. I think they were uh, bussed in, or um, I'm not sure exactly. They. I hmm. never really found that out. Um, but they had a really weird rotation where they would work uh, like a week and then they'd be off for five weeks and then, you know. And there was every, every week we had a different group of Iraqi correctional officers. But I would always look forward to the, the days when I got to spend time with Samir and all of the ones that I made good friends with. But at, and I think it was those guys that uh, allowed me to sit down and eat with them and we had a, a dinner with, you know, lamb and curry and the traditional Middle Eastern. Oh, I'm getting diet. hungry. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. Um, and then um, I want to say that our command allowed one Iraqi to come into the um, quarters where we were at. Um, so it's something that only the most trusted correctional officers are allowed to do and um, he was able to come with me to our galley and sit down and, uh, and I had conversations with him you know and I asked him I said what do you think of the United States being in in your country and at that time he said well he feels secure knowing that the army is out in his neighborhood um, because he, you know, they're protecting their family and um, they're keeping the Taliban out at the time. So um, he was happy about that, that his family, knowing that his family's safe while he would work in the prison. However, um, he also said that um, at the time he wished that we were also out of the country <laughs> uh, because they essentially wanted their country back. They wanted to um, uh, run it themselves again. 
So. What do you think about yourself being in Iraq, in other, other country? Mm -hmm. We invaded it anyway, mm -hmm. right? That's for facts. Mm -hmm. What were you thinking? Were you comfortable being there as occupier and... and well, I mean, from what we were always told was, you know, win the hearts and the minds of the people. So, and, you know, I, I guess I really didn't have an opinion on it at the time. Um, but I knew that what my job was was to make a difference. Um, and I feel like I've made a difference to some extent in that country with oh. those people. Oh. Um, just building relationships and, you know, a lot of them, uh, they... <laughs> They really got to experience what we were like, mm. and I think they realized that we're humans too. Mm -hmm. Like we're well, not humans, but we're we're human beings. We're we're the same, you know. When did you leave that compound, Camp Buka? Uh, my deployment was actually cut short. Um, I had some uh, health problems that were fairly life-threatening at the time from what they told me so I had to leave and be flown to uh, Landstuhl, Germany because I was in, in yep. Maryland for a year. Yeah. So June or July of 2008. What do you think about the Iraqi culture? Um, it's interesting um, to some extent, it, it's almost like primitive lifestyle, very uh, limit or uh, almost like only the basic essentials. Um, you know, there it's not really super elaborate. Um, you know, basic home, basic necessities. Um, from from what I can remember, it at mm -hmm, least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Did you study any about history of Iraq while you serving there? No, but we, um, the army gave us a, book. like a manual or a book mm -hmm. uh, that we were supposed to read, kind of teach you some of the language um, and a little bit of the culture. Are you proud of your service as an Iraqi yeah. veteran? Mm -hmm. Iraq war veteran? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any benefits that you're getting from the VA as a Iraqi veteran? Mm -hmm. What kind? Um, well, most of my health care is taken care of. Um, you know, annual screenings and annual checkups, so that's all free. Um, so it, it, it is a benefit. Uh, another benefit is I was able to uh, use my uh, Montgomery GI Bill post 9-11 GI Bill to go to school. So that was another benefit that uh, I received at, um, after my military service. What did you do? What school did you go? I went to uh, the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Wow. I studied recreation therapy. Uh, I currently have my bachelor's degree in recreational therapy. And uh, I, I practice in, uh, at the uh, veterans home in King. That's good. So what does Montgomery GI Bill pay you? The whole tuition? Um, well, there was the Montgomery GI Bill and the post 9-11 GI Bill. Uh -huh. And just before I discharged from Maryland, they said that they were switching over to the new GI Bill. Um, the Montgomery GI Bill just paid for your schooling, but the post 9-11 GI Bill paid for your living expenses as well. So you would get a monthly stipend. Um, for like what? How like much? A, mm, I want to say it was around 11 or 1200 a month. So, and you would only receive that when you were actually in school. So they would pay you during your yep. time when you were in class. Mm -hmm. And then off, when you weren't in school, uh, you would have to make ends meet okay. on your own. What do you think about media coverage of the Iraq and Iraq war, normal, I mean, in general, mm -hmm. and the Iraqs that you know f mm -hmm. based on your uh, personal experience? Mm -hmm. Do you see any discrepancy there? And do you see any problems in media coverage 
or stereotypes of the Iraq mm -hmm. yeah, that the Americans mean, have? I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, American news, it, it seems to, it gravitates more toward the negative, in my opinion. Uh, it doesn't really cover on the ground things that happen, like real life events, things that happen. And uh, yeah, I think there is some discrepancy to, to that. Mm -hmm. Um, is there any Iraqi War uh, Veterans Association? Yeah, there is the uh, yeah Iraqi uh, War Veterans is IV. It it just started not too long ago. When? Um, oh, I don't even know. Did you join that? But it's that? the Iraqi War Vets of America. Mm -hmm. um, How many members? Do you know? No idea. I wow. I I just stumbled across it not too long ago. Um, I've thought about joining it. Um, just because it's, um, if you think of like the American Legion or yeah. um, you know the VFW, that generation has their own camaraderie, yeah. their own group of individuals. Do you but, think you have a kind of sense of community among those Iraqi War veterans? Oh do yeah. They want oh, to, yeah. Do they want to to be close to each other or? Oh yeah, there's definitely even getting out of the military. You know, just if you meet another guy who served, I mean, there's definitely that camaraderie, you know. And like, uh, for example, I, I went with this group uh, called Heroes Hunt for Veterans, or at the time it was called Heroes Hunt for Wounded Warriors. Um, now it's uh, Heroes Hunt for Veterans. And um, they would allow you to go hunting with a guide, and, um, but you were, we were with two other guys and one guy was from the army and another guy was serving on a police department who served and you know we we got along like right away just because we had that common bond of service and uh, it's just very interesting and I'm still friends with a lot of these guys today even my friends from the uh, USS Nimitz I still keep in contact with them as well so um. What would you say to American young students who wants to know about Iraq? What would you suggest mm -hmm. to do? Uh, ask a veteran. Yeah, ask a <laughs> veteran, right? Uh, ask people who were actually there, yeah? who actually uh, served yeah. and knew about the issues and the things that were going on at the time. And, you know, of course, read history books, um, but don't, don't just read one perspective. You know, broaden your mind, broaden your your understanding. Yep. That you know, look beyond just American textbooks. Look for other evidence. Do you think there will be uh, Iraqi veterans who might be interested in becoming a teacher? You know, going through master mm -hmm. degrees if supported financially, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and become a world history teacher and teaching about the Iraq that they they fought for. Oh, absolutely. Do you think so? I think I think that's needed because um, you know I think that we limit ourselves as far as our education goes. I think we need to be you know world citizens, and we need to understand different issues that are going on in the world. Yeah. And um, I think the best way to do that is having somebody with real life experience teach something like that. So. What if I, my foundation, World History Digital Edu uh, Education Foundation, mm -hmm. initiate that uh, project, mm -hmm. Veterans to Teacher? Mm -hmm. Do you think there will be a, some interest from the veterans? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Danny, it's great to have a long interview with you. First of all, I want to thank you for your support and help for interviews of mm -hmm. Korean War veterans in your veterans home. You're welcome. One of the most beautiful veterans home I ever seen so far. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate your help and the way that you deal uh, and treat veterans, your senior veterans is mm -hmm. very impressive. Thank you. And you know the reason that I wanted to ask, I wanted to do an interview with you because I think, in my opinion, our uh, world history education need to be changed. Mm -hmm. You know, we yeah. need to really attract the attention and interest from our students about the current affairs, and then going back to the history. Right. You know, so that's why I'm trying to do this, and this is the first interview. 
of my foundation okay. with, with the Iraqi war veteran, and you are the one. And I hope that we can, it can be a small first step that we took today. Mm -hmm. And I s wonder if we can make it growing and doing a series of interviews with other Iraqi war veterans mm -hmm. and, and somehow contribute to our understanding among our young generations about the Iraq and mm -hmm. our history, contemporary history, mm -hmm. including the war, right. so that we can build a real good relationship with this country. Yeah. Do you think we can do those? I think so. I think um, by doing that, you can certainly branch off into other areas of, uh, you know, other areas of expertise, whether it be political science or um, other um, specific interests, you know, I think that the more uh, perspective you get from other people, I think the, the better off your foundation will be and uh, um, the better off that um, it, it will produce uh, more global thinking citizens that are more aware of the yeah. issues going on. Yes. Yeah. Um, so. My recommendation for you is to join the Iraqi War Veterans Association of America <laughs> yeah. and bring this idea to them. Okay. And we can go together participating annual reunion if there is any anything Absolutely. like that. Sure. And then we want to talk about these ideas to them. Yeah, definitely. Would you do that? I'd be inclined to do that. Yes. Yes. Great. <laughs> any other message you want to leave to this interview? Um I would just say um, be open-minded, um, look beyond just uh, what you see going on in front of you, you know, you know look, look beyond um, and be a, a global thinker and, and uh, be aware of the issues that are going on in the world. So. Great. This is all the um, artifacts related to Dan's uh, service as a Iraqi war veterans. Please explain those. Well, um, this here is the uh, time that we spent in uh, uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. This is also another picture here. So um, when you were in in New Jersey, yeah, this is the train we were training, training with the for, army. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's another one of uh, when we were out in the field. This here um, is when we were in Kuwait. This was the day that we were flying into uh, Iraq, mm -hmm. and that day it was... Where are you? I'm on the airfield. Where are you in that picture? I'm right here, right in the front. Oh, you are the... Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, and that's me here. So... Um, this is you? Yeah. Okay. And then here, this is the... Uh, these two kind of go hand in hand. This was when I was in Camp Buring. Mm -hmm. uh, the night before we got helicoptered in. Mm -hmm. um, these are my different uh, ribbons here that uh, I was awarded while I was uh, serving overseas. Okay. Um, this is when I was with Naval Security Forces. That was in San Diego, so mm -hmm. I was uh, doing that for a while. These two here uh, are certificates for uh, airframing. Uh, this was my A school certificate of uh, completion. So, okay. Um, this here. Oh. Yep. Or, or what is it? Combat lifesaver. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, then this is citation. Yeah, this citation was actually given to me by the uh, Rear Admiral uh, J T Blake, who's the commander commander of the Carrier Strike Group Eleven at the time. Mm. Um, that was for uh, just my. Uh, outstanding uh, work ethic and I actually saved the Navy mm. almost uh, half a million dollars in replacement costs. Whoa! Yeah. Um, that there's a Battle E uh, document that's for uh, battle efficiency on the USS Nimitz. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually for uh, essentially what that means is that we're a very very good strike group, very good carrier. 